Good morning. It's great to see a good crowd here. Um, if you will, let's stand to sing To God Be the Glory, and then if you'll remain standing for our procession of the flags. No. 
salute and pledge. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands, one brotherhood uniting all Christians in service and in love. Thank you. You may be seated. It's a joy to welcome you this morning to Cross Baptist Church on this patriotic Sunday. Every year on the Sunday before the 4th of July, we have a patriotic emphasis, and it wouldn't be the 4th of July without some good old barbecue. And so we have some barbecue plates being prepared for us to take home under these unusual conditions that we call COVID-19. I'm glad that you're here today. I'm glad that you come to worship. It's good to have at least as many as we can come together in one service this morning. And we're glad that you're here to worship. I pray you will be blessed. I want to take just a moment and uh, recognize our very special guest, Rodney Lewis and his wife, Roshonda, over here to my left. We appreciate them coming and helping us this morning. Let's give them a hand. Rodney is the ROTC instructor at the high school. And Rodney, thank you for coming and thank you for your service to our country. Thank you for being here. There are a few announcements on the back page of your bulletin that I hope you'll make note of. You can read them for yourself. And again, it's good to see you. Now we're going to take a moment now and have a prayer and then we're going to recognize all those that are present who have served in the armed forces or are serving 
And uh, the way we're going to do that is we're going to sing the Armed Forces Medley together. And when you hear the branch of service that represents you, if you're a veteran or are serving now, would you please stand and stand during your song? And then you can be seated. And we're going to recognize all branches of service. So you'll sing along, and we want to recognize you. Would you just please hold your applause to the end? That would be helpful as we sing along with the Armed Forces Medley. So let's have our prayer, then we'll recognize our veterans. Father, we're so thankful to be together today to worship. These are unusual and chaotic times in our nation. We would pray, Father, today for America. We pray for a unity. We pray, pray for a coming back together as a nation under God. We pray for revival to sweep our land, unifying us, helping us to love one another as you have loved us. Help us once again to practice the golden rule, to do unto others as we'd have them do unto us. Father, we need a miracle in our nation. We need revival in our nation. And we pray for that today as your people. Thank you, Father, for a free nation. Thank you for those who have served and are serving that America might be free. Help all of us to stand in these days with courage against those who want to take away our freedoms. We recognize that America today is not perfect. America has issues and flaws, but still, Father, with all of our faults, as we look around the globe, we recognize that we're the best thing going. We pray, Father, that you'll help us turn from the bad, celebrate the good, that we might be a more effective and loving America. And Father, as I close my prayer, I recognize that America will only change when Americans change. May it begin in our hearts today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're going to begin with the army. If you're in the army, you would stand. Over hill, over dale, we have hit the dusty trail as the kids are go rolling along. In and out, in the shop, kind of marching all about as the kids are go rolling along. For it's high, high in the field of jewelry. Count out your numbers, loud and strong. Two, three, four, five, two, three, and where is
Tinker. Please take your Bibles this morning and turn to Joshua chapter 24. Joshua chapter 24. I invite you to take the outline provided for you in the bulletin as well as the scriptures. Open them up and follow along the message this morning. While you're turning to Joshua 24, let me welcome those who are listening today or watching by live stream. Thank you so much for joining us in worship today. I want to begin by reading verse 25 of Joshua 24. My message is entitled America at the Crossroads. America at the Crossroads. Verse 25 of Joshua 24. So Joshua made a covenant. Key word there. Covenant is basically an agreement or a promise between two or more parties. Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and made for them a statue and an ordinance in Shechem. The word or place Shechem, very important in Israel's history. It's the place where God directed Abraham to come and Abraham built an altar there to God. It's the place Jacob would build a well. And it's the place where Jesus would one day meet a woman at that well. Shechem was a very important place in the life of Israel. Joshua made a covenant with the people at a very special place in Shechem. Consider today America at the crossroads. The Battle of the Alamo was fought in San Antonio, Texas, in 18 and 36, when the Texans severed their ties with Mexico, they, they declared themselves free, and the Mexican government responded by quickly sending General Santa Anta and 5,000 troops to the tiny little mission called the Alamo, 150 defenders there. And there among them were some famous defenders or men, men like Davy Crockett, Jim Bowie, William B. Travis. All of them were killed at the Alamo. But the defense of the Alamo was not in vain. It gave Sam Houston time to rally an army for the cause of freedom. Going eastward... Houston and his men came to a fork in the road 
and it's marked by a big tree. In Texas history, it is called the Witch Way Tree. The road to the left went to the marshes of southeast Texas and into Louisiana. The road to the right led to San Jacinto. Houston decided to take the road to the right, and there he found and defeated a surprised and overconfident Mexican army. He captured General Santa Ana and took control of San Jacinto. A new republic was born. Our text tells us that Israel had come to a crossroads. Perhaps we could call it their witch way tree. Moses had led the people out of Egyptian bondage and to the promised land. But because of their disobedience, they were not allowed to go in. And they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Somebody has said that Moses was a typical man. Israel wandered in the wilderness for so long because he refused to stop and ask for directions. No, friend, they wandered in the wilderness because of their disobedience. Later, under the leadership of Joshua, they marched into the promised land, and there they began the conquest. When you look at the text, chapter 24 of Joshua, you find them at a crossroads. They are at a crossroads militarily. The conquest of the promised land was not yet complete. There were battles to fight and stiff opposition to overcome. With God's help, Israel was to drive out the inhabitants of Canaan to claim Canaan as their inheritance. They were at a crossroads militarily. They were also at a crossroads in leadership. Joshua was getting older. He knew that his days were numbered. The book of Joshua ends with three burials. The burial of Joshua. The burial of Joseph. Yeah, they had brought Joseph's bones with them from Egypt. And there they buried them. Also, Eleazar. The son of Aaron was buried, and they were all buried there in the promised land. And these were not sad days, but yet days of triumph, because you see, these three people were now buried in the promised land, the land God gave them. They were buried in their homeland. But now there was a crossroads in leadership. Who would lead the people of God after Joshua? And they also were at a crossroads spiritually. Joshua made a spiritual stand. You've heard it before in chapter 24 and verse 15 where he says, For me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But there was a great temptation among the people of God toward the false gods of Canaan, the false gods of the neighbors that lived around them. So Joshua stated in verse 23 of chapter 24, put away the foreign gods which are among you and incline your heart to the Lord God of Israel. And look at what the people said, verse 24. The people said to Joshua, the Lord our God, we will serve and his voice we will obey. So here in chapter 24, Israel is at a great crossroads. They're at a crossroads militarily. They're at a crossroads in leadership. And they're at a crossroads spiritually. Their future is at stake. And so Joshua calls the people together and makes covenant with them to love the Lord God and to serve the Lord God and be faithful to the Lord Jehovah God. Now I believe this morning that America, as she approaches her 244th birthday, 
stands at a similar crossroads. And I believe her future is at stake. Can I suggest, first of all, America is at a crossroads morally. I'm reminded of the substitute teacher who would tell long and boring stories to her second grade class. And at the end, she would always say, now the moral of the story is. When the regular teacher got back, the class began to tell her, we like you so much better than the substitute. And the teacher said, well, I'm glad. But tell me, why do you like me more than the substitute? And one little boy piped up and said, because you have no morals. <laughs> Friend, America has turned away from the absolute truth of God's Word, and therefore we have lost our morality. There is no longer a standard of what is right and what is wrong in our culture. Our culture has adopted the days of the judges in the Bible, where everyone did what was right in their own eyes. I'm amazed today at how the sanctity of human life has been forsaken. All lives matter. And if you put any color or any nationality before that, that's racism. Our Declaration of Independence says that we all are equal. And if you believe we're all equal, then all lives matter. God created every person. He loves every person. He died for every person. He loves every person. And every life matters to him. That's why he said, you shall not kill. All lives matter. But you know, I really should not be surprised today that the sanctity of human life has been abandoned because we no longer value the life of the unborn baby. In 2017... 862,000 unborn babies were murdered. Over 61 and a half million babies now, since it was legalized, have been murdered. Don't tell me that technically they're not alive until they're born. We've looked into the womb and we see a beating heart and we see undeniable life. And don't tell me that a woman has a right to choose because it's not her right, it's God's right. God has chosen life. God has chosen life. But no wonder life has become so cheap in our culture. If you don't believe in the value of the life in the womb, then why would you believe in the value of life for all others? We're at a crossroads morally in our nation. We're also at a crossroads politically. Christians have bought the lie that the Constitution prohibits the church from being engaged in politics. They yell the principle of separation of church and state. Thomas Jefferson said in 1802, the First Amendment has erected a wall of separation between church and state that the wall is a one, but the wall is a one-directional wall. It keeps the government from running the church, but it makes sure that Christian principles are always in the government. Folks, everything rises and falls on leadership. And it's time for the church to be involved in the leadership of our nation. The Christian voice has been silent long enough. And it's time for the church to speak up and call our nation back to God. Your worldview is how you see things. I read about a husband that was put to sleep to go through a series of tests. His wife 
sat by his side. After a little while, he fluttered his eyebrows. He looked at his wife and he said, you're beautiful. She continued her vigil there next to him and he drifted on back to sleep. In a little while, he opened his eyes again and he looked at her and said, you're cute. And she said, well, what happened to beautiful? And he said, the drugs are wearing off. <laughs> Your worldview is how you see things. And I have read this week that only 4% of adults have a biblical worldview according to the Bonner research findings. And what is even more disheartening to me, only 51% of ministers across this nation, they have found, has a biblical world view. People are busy just surviving the chaos. They're not worried about absolute truth anymore. I want to stand before you today and say I unapologetically have a biblical worldview. It's not Democrat or Republican. Although there have been people through the years who have said, Preacher, that's the typical Republican viewpoint. But let me just say, friend, as a Christian, as a Bible-believing Christian, how can I support anyone who believes in the murder of unborn babies? How can I support anyone who seeks a godless culture? How can I support anyone who wants to suppress my religious freedom? And how can I support anyone who wants to destroy the sovereignty and greatness of America that is destined to stand by God's people, Israel? My biblical worldview will not let me go there. And I think it's time for Bible-believing Christians to stand up. Speak up. We're at a crossroads politically and we're at a crossroads spiritually. Folks, our religious liberty is under attack. Some governors across this nation are doing everything they can to keep the church closed. Many seek to take Jehovah God completely out of our culture. I came across the words of George Washington. They were spoken in his final address to the nation. This is what he said. Do not let anyone claim the tribute of American patriotism if they ever attempt to remove religion from politics. A bumper sticker read, Russia put God in school, America took him out. Friends, something is terribly wrong when they pray every day in the halls of Congress, but you can't pray in the schools of America. Now let me say this, and I hope you'll hear what I'm saying. The ongoing battle for the heart of America today is not Democrat versus Republican. It just manifests itself there. But the real battle is between good and evil. It's between God and Satan. Satan is trying to do everything he can to destroy the greatness of America because he knows America has a divine destiny. Prayer, God's Word, the courage to stand are the weapons that we must use in these days. I believe it's time for God's people to gather in His churches all across our nation and uh, make covenant with Him like Israel of old. And again, commit ourselves to make Him our God. And we commit ourselves to being His people. It's time to come back to God's holy word. It's time to come back to a nation under God. It's time to again work at building his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Now that's the introduction that is in place. I want to take you back to verse 25 and the word covenant. I want to look at the covenant that Israel made with God. I believe there's three things here that 
is found in the covenant, and there are three things that America must do at the crossroads. The first thing I see is this. We must review our blessings. Review our blessings. That's what God led Joshua to do. Joshua stood before the people at Shechem, and God, through Joshua, led or reviewed his blessings. Clearly, God is speaking through Joshua because 17 times here in this chapter, you find the personal pronoun I. I took, I gave, I plagued, I brought, I delivered. God is speaking through Joshua, telling the people, reviewing what he had done for his people. Friend, these are things God has done. The song says it so well, doesn't it? Count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what God has done. And so God is reminding his people what he has done. In verses 2 through 4, Joshua spoke of the covenant. You remember how God established a covenant with Abraham, then extended it through Isaac and Jacob and all their descendants. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the descendants, the great nation of Israel, are, tramp, are champions or trophies, if you will, of God's grace. In verse 5, Joshua speaks of Israel's freedom from Egyptian bondage. After 400 years of slavery in Egypt, God delivered them. And they came to that place called the Red Sea. And God parted the waters. And the people walked across on dry ground. And the army of Egypt pursued them. And God released the waters. And destroyed the army of Egypt. In verse 8, Joshua spoke of how God gave them the win or the victory over the Amorites. Then in verses 11 and 12, Joshua speaks of the great victory at Jericho and how God gave them victory over the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. I like to throw in the Parasites. But notice verse 13. Notice what it says. I have given you a land for which you did not labor, cities which you did not build, and you dwell in them. You eat of the vineyards and the olive groves which you did not plant. God gave the people a ready-made nation complete with infrastructure and economy and clout. God has richly blessed his people, and he's laying it all out for a review. Could I suggest to you today that America at her crossroads needs to review her blessings. We could talk about America's wealth. In 2018, Americans held over $98 trillion of wealth. America consists of only 6% of the world's geography, but controls 30% of the world's wealth. We are blessed materially. We are blessed financially. We are blessed with great wealth. But I want to tell you today that America's greatest blessing is her freedom. And some are trying to take it away. Hear this quote from Ronald Reagan. Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same. Or one day we'll spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it once was like in the United States to be free. Archibald Rutledge tells of a young boy 
who was always catching things and putting them in a cage. He loved the mockingbird. He loved to hear the mockingbird sing. And so he thought, I'm going to capture one, put it in a cage, put it outside my window so I can always hear it sing. And so he caught a young mockingbird, put it in a cage. On the second day, he saw a mother mockingbird fly to that cage, feed that young bird some berries. It thrilled young Archibald, and he was proud of what he had done. But the next morning when he went out to the cage, the mockingbird was dead. Later, a renowned scholar told Archibald, that a mother mockingbird, finding her young in a cage, will sometimes feed it poisonous berries. She evidently thinks it's better for the one she loves to die than be in captivity. That seems to be the conviction of America. We had rather die than live in captivity. The words of Patrick Henry rang true. Give me liberty or give me death. Freedom has inspired millions to give their lives to defend it. A little boy of seven named Alex was staring at a large pla plaque in the church foyer. The plaque was covered with names and small American flags. And as Alex looked at that plaque, the preacher came and stood beside him. And he said, Pastor, what is that? And he said, well, that's the memorial to all the young men and women who died in the service. And young Alex thought a minute and said, which service, the 8.30 or the 11 o'clock? <laughs> Millions have died in the service to our country. William Tanner, who was at one time president of what we call now in Southern Baptist, the National, or the, yeah, the, the National Mission Board, uh, or North American Mission Board. He told a story from his boyhood in Texas. Every week an insurance salesman would put a different display in the window there concerning the World War II effort. And he said one day he came around the corner and he saw in the, in the window a display that had been blown up to about three feet by three feet, and it showed a soldier lying in the sand face down with his helmet blown off of his head and his arm is reaching for his weapon that's just out of his reach. And below was a caption that read, What have you done for your country today that a soldier should die for tomorrow? What have you done for your country today that a soldier should die for you tomorrow. Oh, friend, listen to me. America is free. That's a great blessing from God. It's time for Americans to live like we deserve it. Number two, as they came to their crossroads, Israel remembered their heritage. That's what America must do. We must remember our heritage. In verses two through five, Joshua speaks of Israel's heritage by speaking of her leaders, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. He talks about the mighty man Moses and his talented brother who spoke with such eloquence. His name was Aaron. You see, Israel's heritage was in her people. Some today want to take away or erase the heritage of America. They want to make villains out of those who gave so much to win and to keep America free. Were they perfect? No. But they made choices based on the light they had at the time. They made choices based on the experiences that they had learned up until their day. Friend, we've got more light today. We've got broader experiences. We've gleaned more wisdom in our day than they had. And I would like to suggest rather than vilifying them, we need to recognize them for what they have done for America. John Adams, July the 3rd, 1776, on the night before the declaration was signed, he wrote, 
I am well aware of the toil, the blood, and the treasure it will cost to maintain this declaration. We need to remember those 56 names of the Continental Congress that signed the Declaration of Independence. Friend, it cost them dearly. Of the 56 men, five were captured by the British and tortured to death. Twelve had their homes ransacked and burned. Two lost their sons in the Revolutionary Army. Another two had sons captured. Nine, nine of the 56 fought and died in the war. Carter Braxton of Virginia, a wealthy planter and trader, saw his ships sunk by the British Navy. He sold his house, all that he had to pay off his debt. He died in poverty. At the Battle of Yorktown, the British General Cornwallis had taken over Thomas Nelson's house as his headquarters. Nelson quietly got word to Washington to bomb the house or to, to attack the headquarters. And so he did, and it destroyed his home. Nelson died bankrupt. John Hart was driven by his wife's side who was dying. Their 13 children ran for their lives. His fields were all destroyed. For over a year he lived in caves and the forest. And he came home and his wife was dead and his 13 children had vanished. One week later he died from exhaustion. Folks, listen, we cannot erase our past. And while there has been bad, there has been a lot of good. I think we ought to correct the bad, celebrate the good. We stand on the shoulder of giants. We need to remember our heritage. How can we correct the future if we forget our past? Number three and finally, as Israel made the covenant, they renewed their faith. That's what America needs to do. We need to renew our faith. Four times, Joshua calls Israel to turn away from their false gods and commit to Jehovah God. Let me show you what I'm talking about. In verses 14 and 15, look at what Joshua says. Now therefore fear the Lord. Serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether it will be the gods of your fathers that served, that served on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And look at what the people said, verse 16. Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. Verses 19 and 20. Joshua said to the people, you cannot serve the Lord, for he's holy. He's a holy God. He's a jealous God. He'll not forgive your trespasses nor your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, he will turn and do you harm and consume you after he has done you good. And the people said, verse 21, No, we'll serve the Lord. Verse 22, You are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen the Lord for yourselves to serve Him. Verse 23, or the last part of verse 22, They said, We are witnesses. Verse 23, Therefore he said, put away the foreign gods which are among you and incline your heart to the Lord God of Israel. And the people said, the Lord our God we will serve and his voice we will obey as a nation. Israel renewed their faith in Jehovah God. I suggest today that America needs to put away her false gods and turn back to Jehovah God. Say, preacher, what kind of false gods are you talking about? I'm talking about anything that comes before you or comes between you and Jehovah God. Anything in your life that is maybe above Jehovah God in your life is a God. Any material possession, any relationship, any job, any pleasure that you place over God in your life is your God. Now I know it's not politically correct to say this. But the reason I believe America needs to return to Jehovah God is because America was founded as a Christian nation. And by that I mean 
Most of the founders were devout Orthodox Christians who consciously drew from their Christian convictions to establish the foundation of this nation and answer most political issues. Every state, all 50 states, acknowledge God in their constitution. I'll just read for you Alabama's. We the people of the state of Alabama, invoking the favor and guidance of Almighty God, do ordain and establish the following constitution. Every state of this great America has, has established their constitution on God, the God of the Bible. It is clear to me that God is woven into every part of Americans' history. I believe America was divinely discovered. No, Columbus got lost. Did he really? I believe he's, God's hand was upon him. I believe America has been divinely founded. I also believe America has been divinely sustained and richly blessed. Some want to apologize for America's greatness. Folks, how can you apologize for America's greatness when it's a God thing? When it's a God thing. God is going to use a sovereign and strong America when the whole world comes against his people when he comes again. Some have asked, preacher, why do you believe that? Revelation chapter 12, verse 14. The woman, which is Israel, was given the two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to a place prepared for her in the wilderness where she would be taken care of for a time, times and a half a time, out of the serpent's reach. Two wings of an eagle. What is the emblem of America? The eagle. You see, friend, the devil doesn't like a sovereign and strong America. And he's doing everything he can to weaken us and divide us because he does not want us sovereign and strong that we might stand when Jesus comes in glory by God's people. And America must renew the struggle and must renew her faith. Here's what I've said. Like Israel of old, America is at a great crossroads. Our future is at stake. I believe the answer lies here in the 24th chapter of Joshua. We should review our blessings. We should remember our heritage, and we should renew our faith. I'll leave you with the words of the great communicator Vance Hafner. He said, there's a price to be paid to be a godly man or a godly woman. You have to buck the current because the tide is running the other way. You hear that, Christian? You got to buck the current because it's running the other way. Let's pray. Father, thank you for allowing me to share your word today. I pray it's been your word and not my opinion. I so sincerely want to have a world, biblical worldview. And I believe America today, with all of her faults, is still great. We've got a lot of things to correct, but we've got a lot of things to celebrate. And I pray through the power of your Holy Spirit you'll bring unity to our nation and that you will help us as Christians begin to view our world 
and began to view our decisions through the lens of your word and not the lens of the culture. May we see things like you see. May we practice our faith each and every day. Father, I really believe Christians can make a difference in our nation, in our world, and in this day of chaos. May we be faithful. May we show. May we share that Jesus really is the answer. In Jesus' name, I